is Bloomberg Technology. Over the next hour, we will be speaking to some of the biggest names in gaming, including Take Two CEO Strauss Zelnick and Nintendo America's Reggie fils -Aimé on the latest trends and how they are keeping up with them. Plus, the CEO of eSports Arena joins us from E3, how people watching people play games is revolutionizing the industry. And highlights from Bloomberg TV's wide-ranging and exclusive conversation with Apple CEO Tim Cook that you don't want to miss. First, to our top story. We are here in Los Angeles at the video game industry's biggest show of the year, E3, the Electronic Entertainment Expo. Some of the hottest names in gaming are here showcasing new titles, hardware, and the latest gaming trends. But it's the year-old free global hit Fortnite that is the talk of the event. The multiplayer shooting title released last year by closely held Epic Games has become a cultural phenomenon. And while Epic Games may be reaping most of the benefits, one CEO is saying this game is actually benefiting industry. Take-Two CEO Strauss Selnick says as, as first-time gamers take to Fortnite, they will start looking for other titles as well. Strauss Selnick joins me now. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. So what do you think about how Fortnite is shaking up the industry for better and for worse? I'm not sure it's shaking up. It's a hit. It's a great thing for the industry to have hits. We wish we had all of them. We have a lot of them, but not all of them. I think in the case of Fortnite, there's some evidence we're, we're bringing on board a younger audience, perhaps a more female audience. And if people are being introduced to video games and they learn to love them, that's great for all of us. Does it change how you think about how free-to-play games should be part of your business? Well, free-to-play games are part of our business. We have NBA 2K Online in China. We acquired a company called Social Point about a year and a half ago. They have, uh, But perhaps uh, more so. We definitely think so. Our, our acquisition of Social Point was really to make the point that in addition to our free-to-play titles, which include WWE Supercard and our NBA title, we wanted to have a broader footprint, and Social Point makes games that are made for the free-to-play business. Well, and just like any hit, could it just be a flash in the pan? I don't think it's a flash in the, uh, the pan at all, and uh, and again, uh, I, it's it's been a huge success for the folks at Epic, and they, they have a lot to be proud of. So, three big titles coming out in October, including yours, Red Dead Redemption 2, Activision's Call of Duty, EA Battlefield 5. How do you make sure yours is the winner? The way we... Um, the way we create success, the entire focus of our company is on the quality of our titles. Uh, Red Dead Redemption is, has been a highly anticipated title. Um, we've begun to put some assets into the marketplace and, and people seem to love them. Uh, Pre-orders are strong. We're feeling really good about Red Dead Redemption. It does stand alone in terms of the theme. There aren't, there aren't very many Western theme titles in the marketplace. When we put out Red Dead Redemption um, the first time, uh, conventional wisdom was that Westerns couldn't work, and it was a massive hit. It sold in over 16 million units. We feel really good about Red Dead Redemption. So too. it's just a few months away. Why aren't you showing it at E3? Everyone wants to see it. Seems like a great opportunity we're to actually, generate buzz. Yeah, we're actually not showing products at E3. We found, actually, this show for us is, is a great place to connect with our, um, our retail customers, a great place to connect with the press and with industry analysts, with investors, and, uh, and our products are, are widely marketed and, and people have a sense of them. Um, while we do have consumers here at E3, it is not primarily a consumer show. So how do you intend to monetize it and make sure that it generates revenue over a long period of time? Our focus over a long period of time is engagement. And, and what we've said is with regard to all of our releases, we want to give consumers an opportunity not only to fall in love with the product, but to stay in love with the product over a long period of time. If we do that, revenue, profits follow, we don't lead with monetization. It's not our primary concern. We're concerned about entertaining, captivating, engaging consumers over a long period of time. I'm curious about your thoughts on the latest gaming industry controversy, loot boxes and these play to win, pay to win tactics. You know, is that healthy for the industry or is it exploitative? I don't believe it's exploitive. I think at the end of the day, this is entertainment. Entertainment is not a must-have good. It's a want-to-have good. We choose to be entertained. Um, the the um, randomization mechanic has been used by us in the past. It is not a mechanic that we typically use. We do not uh, have any problem with it, however. And I think the bottom line is, do, do your game mechanics fit with your creative offering? 
And, and, if, concern, and if they don't, consumers won't show up. Any concern that legislators are, are going to crack down on this? I don't think that there's a concern in the U.S. There may be concern in international markets in the same way that we have, you know, uh, pure freedom of speech here in the U.S. And in certain international markets, we are constrained as to what we can do creatively. So you think in Europe they could crack down? I, I'm not sure which. I don't think it'll be across the board. It's possible one or two countries will have a point of view about what kind of mechanic can be used. I think that would be wrongheaded, and it hasn't happened yet. But it and yet, last month, the Supreme Court uh, ruled to strike down a law preventing gambling in sports. And I know you've expressed optimism that this could have an impact on esports. You know, how optimistic are you doing things to prepare for potentially legalized esports gambling, we legalized are, gambling in gaming? We are not yet. We're open minded. Um, we are an entertainment company. We're obviously not a gambling company. It's a different mechanic, it's really a different business and it requires regulation. I think we'd have to think long and hard before going into that business. However, it, it clearly creates opportunity. There are concerns resurfacing about addiction and, you know, athletes ruining their careers over video game addictions. Apple is adding new features to monitor screen time. Should the video game industry be doing more? I think you can always do more, mm -hmm. and, if, and if people need help, it's our job to, to help them. Um, our, our products are not meant to be um, consumed 24 hours a day, and I think a very small part of the populace doesn't exercise moderation with regard to any number of things that they can do. Many things that are uh, okay in moderation are simply not okay in excess. That said, uh, I think, I think uh, we actually don't seek to soak up all of people's free time. We, we seek to entertain people over a moderate period of time. I would also observe the media day is very long now. It's about 22 hours because people process a lot of media. Video games on average are only about an hour and a half of that day. We're still a very small part of the media day compared to say television, which is five hours a day. Some folks are saying this could be the last <laughs> generation of consoles. Do you believe it? I don't actually. I don't think there's any evidence that that will be the case. Remember though, we're ecumenical. We want to be where the consumer is. Um, Ten years ago, for a console release, the PC format was virtually non-existent. Today, it can be 40% of our sales for a console-type title. So clearly, the market is opening up, and consoles are not the only game in town. However, Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony are key partners of ours, key creative partners. They deliver great products, and we think they're going to keep doing that, and we intend to support them. VR, what's your take on I ask you every year. My the same, and I would argue that so far my take has been right. Right, right. which is? Well, so far it's about a zero billion dollar business. Right? But Except on the investment side. What will side. it be? Mm -hmm. What will, I mean, is the fact that your take has continued to be proven true make you even more pessimistic about the uh, ability or the opportunity to make money? We've already put out some titles in VR, so clearly we want to exercise mm -hmm. our creative chops. Clearly we want to be ready technically for anything that may come along. There are numerous barriers for a virtual reality video game experience, not the least being that if you're moving around in the space with a headset on, um, you know, that can be an uncomfortable experience, uh, a nauseating experience, frankly, for people, for most people. Um, it's exciting. Most people don't consume entertainment in a solitary way, and people don't generally like vision and hearing, including headsets. Those are two of the numerous problems that I perceive. But I think, for example, in an arcade setting, VR might work. AR? AR is an exciting technology. It was already exercised in Pokemon Go. Um, I think like every, every part of the technological landscape, the question is, what do you do with it? Uh, AR, however, doesn't require that you wear a headset. It doesn't include your vision. It doesn't include your hearing. You can interact with others. I don't see any barriers to AR working. The only question now is, what do we do? What do our competitors do creatively with it? And if I had to guess, I think someone will come up with a great creative execution. May not be us, maybe us, but someone will, will come up with a great creative execution. All right, take two CEO Strauss Selman. Great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Okay, coming up, remember the days of playing games on Facebook when Farmville was all your friends posted about? Well, the social media giant has a new major push into gaming content, but can it compete with the likes of Twitch and more? We will find out next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
women in gaming. They're more than just gamers, they're also part of the community building games, but diversity in the gaming industry is still severely lacking. According to a 2017 International Game Developers Association survey, 42% of developers feel diversity in the gaming industry needs to be increased. One company trying to make gaming more inclusive is Facebook. The social media giant recently launched its Women in Gaming, gaming Initiative, and it begins with a Facebook page where women in gaming can come together as a community. Here to tell us more, Aoife Brodigan, Facebook's head of global business marketing and gaming. Aoife, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So you are leading this Women in Gaming initiative. What does this actually involve? So we launched our Facebook Women in Gaming initiative in February this year, and really our goal is to champion diversity in the industry and encourage more women into the industry. We feel women have a really important role to play in this industry. All around the world, half of gamers are female, but when you look at the industry workforce statistics, only 23% of the workforce identify as female and we think that we can change that we'd like to encourage more women into the industry because we believe bringing more women into the industry will encourage more diversity and will in the end lead to building better games how do you get them there I mean it's not just about convincing them to join it's about convincing companies to hire them and create more hospitable environments for women to work so one of the ways that we're doing that is that we've launched a She Talks Games initiative where we're going out to the industry and we're interviewing women about what it's like to work in the industry today. So we believe by showing the diversity of careers and opportunities open to young women that we can encourage more women to come join us. Are you running into any resistance? You know, I, I recently wrote a book where there, you know, one of the chapters focuses on, on women in gaming and the lack thereof and, and Gamergate and just how vicious that was. Are you... Are you feeling any resistance from the gaming industry to be more inclusive. So I think what's really interesting about the She Talks Games initiative is just the amount of women that have stepped forward and want to share their story. They want to show the positive side of working in the gaming industry. And it's a really exciting industry to be in as well. It's a future-proofing industry. Uh, young women can learn a lot in this, in this industry and we feel that um, their presence would really kind of enhance um, our, our opportunity to grow better games. Well, talk to me about the impact that you think having more diverse teams creating games would have on the games themselves. I mean, would video games be so violent? Would there be so many first-person shooters? So I think it's really important to have choice in the gaming industry. I think by having more voices at the table, we'll get a better variety of games out there overall. What is Facebook doing at Facebook to put your money where your mouth is and walk the walk? So we believe in, first of all, first and foremost, is investing in this Women in Gaming initiative. Um, our overall mission is to bring the world closer together and help um, people build community. And we feel there's value in helping women build a community. Um, so first and foremost, it's, it's about showcasing the amount of uh, careers and opportunities open to young women, but then also uh, giving them a support network so when they join the industry, they have people that they can lean on to um, encourage them to go further. And, you know, in general, Facebook has had a com complicated relationship with the gaming community, but you are trying to change that. Why should people choose Facebook over some of these other platforms? So I think, I, you know, I can only really kind of speak to our um, overall mission, which is to bring the world closer together and help um, people to build community. And that's what we uh, think about when we think about gaming. We want to build the world's largest community for gamers. All right. Aoife brought again Facebook. Thank you so much for stopping by us. Okay, coming up, console gaming may soon be coming to an end, but Microsoft has plans to make the gaming, this gaming the center of the streaming universe. That is next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. console wars, the top two names are Sony's PlayStation 4 and Microsoft's Xbox. Now, while Microsoft has lost ground in the current console cycle to Sony, it's using E3 to announce a major push to bridge the gap. Microsoft is doubling its number of video game studios by acquiring five new ones, including Undead Labs, and it showed off 52 games, 15 of which were world premieres, including the latest entries in the popular racing series Forza and its, its exclusive first-person shooter series Halo. Here to tell me 
more, including news that Microsoft is building a game streaming service, think Netflix, but for gaming, is Microsoft's head of studios, Matt Booty. So Matt, this idea, Netflix for gaming, has been talked about for years, but has never been accomplished. Why do you think it can be done now? I think right now we're really focused on player choice. There are more ways than ever for people to play video games, whether they're buying them at retail, buying them digitally, or we believe uh, having access to a great library of games that they get through our subscription service, Game Pass. It really is about player choice. We see people uh, finding games that they might not have known about, uh, trying to play games that they might not have otherwise uh, engaged in, and it's just been uh, for us about community, about a bigger audience, and about player choice, a new way to find games. Sony launched their game streaming service four years ago to limited success. What makes you think you can do better, A, and that B, you can really play catch up? Well, for us, everything is, starts with the player, and we think that we've got a service that really uh, dials in exactly what our fans and what our players are after, which is choice, access to a big library of games, including some of our biggest franchises. Um, we've also been real fortunate. We announced at E3 on Sunday in our briefing that some of our big partners like Ubisoft are bringing the division into Game Pass. So it's a a wonderful lineup of games and it's really based on access for the players. So when it comes to software, how do you continue to compete with Sony? I mean, that really is the question, right? It's a wonderful time in the games industry. Um, I think we're headed into one of the most amazing falls in terms of lineups across all platforms. The technology is mature. We see teams that have really been able to deal with it. Um, and I'm just excited about all the innovation going on in our studios. You saw some amazing graphics from our Forza team and our new game Forza Horizon. And the Halo team uh, showed off some of the work they've been doing. How is Fortnite changing the way you're thinking about your business? You know, Fortnite is, uh, first, it's great that it's become so popular. I think it's brought a whole new uh, class of players into the game. We see young people playing the game. Uh, it's great that Fortnite is a game that uh, young women are engaging in, which is great. I think it's got a great broad audience. Uh, again, it comes back to us about player choice. That's a kind of game. It's got a, a certain way of play and a certain way of engaging, uh, and it just represents one of the many ways that we like to connect with our fans. Do you think it, it, it's going to be a long-term hit, or do you think... It could be just a moment. You know, I wish that I had that crystal ball <laughs> to know. Uh, the industry is full of things that have come and gone and things that have lasted for decades, so we'll see. How much do you think it'll change your business going forward? I mean, how is it changing how you think about how you make money? Now, for us, and I'm, uh, games really take quite a while to make, right? Every game has got a pretty long cycle. So while we look at things like Fortnite to inform what our fans like and what our players are engaging in, the games that we're making today really have to start with an idea and a way to connect with the player and that's what we're really focused on. There are people out there saying this is the last generation of consoles. Would you agree? You know, we think that there are, that people love playing games in their living room, and there are a whole bunch of people that want a really high-powered box in their living room so they can play on their TV. We know that mobile's growing, we know that PC is growing, but we're committed to console because we think it's a great way to So game. there will be a new Xbox. We're committed to, <laughs> to consoles. We think it's a great way to play. Um, you, you made a number of acquisitions of studios. Talk to me about the strategy. We went out to find creators, people with great ideas that had teams that know how to execute on those ideas. When you think about uh, the team at Ninja Theory, they just made a great game with Hellblade. You think about what Guillaume and the team are doing at Compulsion, it really starts with a creative core and what we can do to bring them into our family and support them to do more of that. Windows 10 is playing a bigger role in Xbox, but Microsoft still doesn't make any money from it. There's been talk of a potential buyout, rumors um, of, a, of a partnership of some sort. You know, what might we see there? Well, uh, we're very fortunate to be a part of Microsoft and have access to all the folks that are working on Windows 10 and console. When we think about uh, advancements in graphics, advancements in technology, being part of Microsoft is a real advantage for Xbox. So, I know you, you said you don't have a crystal ball, but you do have to plan for the future. You do have to map Absolutely. out your strategy, especially since the life cycle of the development of a game is so long. So when you look at gaming five years from now, what's the same and what's different? Well, I think we'll absolutely see advancements in graphics like we always have in consoles. But, you know, we're focused on things right now. One of the things we talked about is our fast start technology. I think that uh, the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning is going to play an increased role. And again, we feel lucky as Xbox to sit so close to the folks at Microsoft that are working on technology like that. Is the future cloud-based? I think cloud will certainly be a pervasive technology. Um, some of the stuff that we're showing here at E3, uh, Forza Horizon 4 takes place in a shared open 
open world. All of that is powered on the back end by the cloud. Um, and it will be a pervasive tech in most games, I think. But in five years, you think people will still be buying physical games? You know, um, for us, I, we are about player choice. We still see so many people wanting to buy games at retail. We support that. We won't see people buying digital. And like we talked about, we see people engaging with Game Pass. Um, we're going to follow where people want to uh, buy those games. We, we're really more about what's the most choice for the player. Now, I know addiction has been a topic for the gaming industry for a long time. Recently, we saw Apple making moves to curb tech addiction under sure. some pressure, but yeah. you know, new monitoring tools, new uh, ways to measure your screen time. Is that something the video game industry should be taking more seriously? Well, at Xbox, and I'm proud to work for Xbox in that we have very sophisticated tools for parents to set limits on what kinds of games uh, can be played on a console. We have uh, tools to set limits on screen time. You know, our core belief about games is that games bring us together. There's something we can all engage in, and we think it's a great activity for families. We encourage parents to be involved in the games that their children are playing. And again, we uh, just feel really proud about the tools that we provide so that people can make choices about how they want to spend their screen time. Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, has tied pay to diversity outcomes. And yeah. what are you doing at Xbox to hire more women, yeah. hire more minorities, promote them, and make sure that they're represented in games as well. Yeah. So if we start with the idea that games are global and games are for everyone, our development teams need to reflect the diversity that's out in the world. Um, we, and with the team that I get to work with, is uh, we have a great diverse lineup of studio heads. Bonnie Ross, who runs Halo for us. Shannon Loftus runs our publishing team. Helen Chang looks after Minecraft for us. And uh, Sarah Bond is a woman who runs our business development team. We're pretty committed to making sure that our teams reflect the diversity that we want to see in games. Are you seeing a shift in the demographics of players? We absolutely are. There are almost two billion players, uh, people playing games on the planet today. As that number grows, it is absolutely going to start to reflect the balance of people that live on the planet out of that two billion. All right. Matt Booty, Microsoft's head of studios. Thank Great. you so Thank much, you very much for joining us. Coming up, the gaming craze that is upending the industry. Fortnite is headed to Nintendo Switch. How will adding the hottest game on the block impact the maker of Mario? We will ask Nintendo of America president Reggie fils May next. And later on, Apple CEO Tim Cook talks to Bloomberg, making a big promise about the company's investments in the United States and looking back at Apple's growth since he took over as CEO. This is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang at the E3 conference in Los Angeles, where the biggest names in gaming are showing off what they have in store. One company that annually makes a super smash at this event is Nintendo. However, the company shares sank after unveiling few new titles for the Switch console. Almost all of the main content displayed during the show was either announced or leaked in the prior weeks and months, including Fortnite, Pokemon, and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Wednesday's share drop pushed Nintendo to its lowest since September, wiping out all the market gains made after its strongest holiday season season in eight years. Joining us now, Nintendo of America President and COO Reggie fils -Aimé. That is quite an introduction. It is. Let's talk about the stock because sure. investors seem to believe all there's no more surprises. Nothing left this year. Would they be correct? They wouldn't. You know, Nintendo as a company loves to surprise people. So what that means when we approach an event like E3 is we show content that's going to launch over the next six to nine months and no more. And so we always have more surprises. There's always more in store. And so why the analysts reacted to the way they did, who knows? But we know from a company perspective, there's a lot more up our sleeves and there's a lot more that we have to show over the weeks and months ahead. Oh, but tell us the surprises. Right here, right now. <laughs> you know, but you know, for, for us, we believe there's a lot more value for the consumer 
to tell them about content and then launch it, just like we did for Fortnite. And Fortnite already has two million downloads specifically on the Nintendo Switch. Wow. So for us, by surprising the fans and driving this type of excitement, we're able to move the business forward, and that's what most most important to us. So Super Smash Brothers, Fortnite, new Pokemon games, which one is going to move the needle the most for Nintendo this year? You know, for us, the way we look at it is we have an opportunity in the here and now to continue driving momentum. Fortnite, the Octo expansion for Splatoon 2 that's launching tonight, uh, uh, Mario Party uh, launching in October, Pokemon launching in November, right before Black Friday, and then Super Smash Brothers Ultimate in December. It's the pacing of news, the pacing of launches that's gonna drive the business forward. Let's talk about the online service. You do have that coming in September, which means it's, it's, it's cloud-based and the network performance of the games that you've been trialing has been bad. I mean, some players have said that it's unplayable. Is that gonna improve? Absolutely, and again, we need to be clear. When we do a trial event, for example, with Mario Tennis Aces, we're as much learning about the, the technical infrastructure as well as the way the game is gonna play. And so you have to expect some challenges when you do that. When we launch the game, it's going to perform just like it did for Fortnite. Okay, let's talk about the Switch. You have added some incentives to make it cheaper for people to buy a second one. Are there gonna be more of those incentives? So those incentives are specific to the Japanese market. And so that's not coming to so the US. So it's not coming to the North American marketplace. And, and this reflects just the difference in culture and the difference in living situations that you have across the world. Japanese homes, small, typically one TV in the household. So for that market, offering a, an additional SKU that takes out HDMI cables and things of that nature makes sense. Here in the Americas, three TVs per household, big TVs for us, selling a fully configured second switch into the home is what we're focused on, and we're seeing that happen. And we especially expect to see that happen with Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. There are some concerns, though, that the switch can't sort of carry the torch for both the 3DS and the Wii. What are you doing to make it more attractive? Well, but, you know, so again, let's focus in on the Americas and the U.S. marketplace. In the month of December, our dedicated handheld business, 2DS, 3DS, grew by 27% year on year. So far this year, our 2DS, 3DS business is up 10% this year. So the switch is not all on its own. It's getting some very strong support by a dedicated handheld business here in the Americas. And for us, we want to continue driving both of those platforms. The dedicated business for 2DS, 3DS is for kids uh, and for families to get engaged for the first time potentially in video games. And then the Nintendo Switch is going to be that game where consumers want to play Smash Brothers and Zelda and all of these big epic games. And that's what we're looking to do. Speaking of epic games, Fortnite, Arena of Valor, Pokemon Quest. It's great that these games are a success. They are also free to play. How are they going to make money for Nintendo? So the way they get monetized is the consumer buys uh, either uh, attire or, or season passes, things of that nature. And as long as those merchandise well, then there's a strong profit for us and for the developer themselves. What's Nintendo's opinion on loot boxes and these pay-to-win tactics? You know, loot boxes broadly speaking, have gotten a bit of a bad rap. Mm -hmm. The game mechanic of buying something that you're not quite sure what's inside is as old as baseball cards, mm -hmm. as an example. And so what we believe, for example, at Nintendo is that a, a gameplay mechanic that offers the consumer something to buy that they're not sure what's inside can be interesting as long as that's not the only way that you could get those items. And I think that's where maybe some developers have made some mistakes. For us, it's one of many mechanics that we can use to drive ongoing engagement in the game. So tell us about the new president and what might change for you, so Mr. your new president. So Mr. <laughs> Furukawa, you know, he's a veteran 25 years with the company. What's great about him is he's had some fairly extensive experience outside of Japan. He was one of the first financial people that Nintendo of America was dealing with uh, back in our early days. He spent 12 years in Europe, so he really has an understanding for the overseas subsidiary. He loves our content, plays our games. So from my perspective, he's a great choice to be our next global president.
You've told me that Nintendo will do esports in a uniquely Nintendo way. What does that mean? Could the Olympics be involved? Uh, you know, interestingly, the f potentially the first time that uh, esports will be in an Olympic sport will be in the Tokyo Olympics in 2020. So that would be an interesting venue. But look, so when we talk about doing esports uniquely, for example, it's what we did here at E3. We held a global uh, Splatoon 2 uh, championship that was held here. We had an invitational for Super Smash Brothers. What we want to do is create the content that enables consumers to come together and, and these professional players to come together and play. We create uh, consistent rules and a consistent structure and then encourage the community to, to go from there. And so far that's working for us. It's really building from the ground up these fantastic gaming communities that support our games. And when it comes to making money, and especially from these free-to-play games, I know you're not going to tell me the exact revenue breakdown, but how would you describe the relationship with publishers? I mean, are you making more than half? So the relationship with developers, because, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're the platform holder. And so the relationship with the developers is, you know, from my standpoint, it's a fair relationship. They've invested to create the game. Mm -hmm. We've invested to create the platform and the infrastructure, the revenue split, the profit split is a fair construct and enables companies like Epic to drive their profitability, enables companies like us to drive our profitability. So what do you have to say to the investors who are skeptical in this moment? You know, so so here's, uh, here's an interesting factoid. As you look at, as you look at Nintendo over these many years, if you look at the number of analysts who've actually gotten it right, it's fairly small. And it's because we as a company, we hold things close to the vest, we love to surprise the overall community and environment, and when we surprise, we surprise big. Just look at Switch, just look at some of the other games. And so, what I say is, you know, don't worry, we're driving the business forward, we're driving engagement on the platform, that's what's most important. All right, you heard it here. Nintendo of America President Reggie fils -Aimé. good to see you in person. Same here. Thanks for stopping by. All right, well, in an interview for the David Robenstein Show here on Bloomberg Television, Apple CEO Tim Cook says the company will inject $350 billion into the United States economy over the next five years. We're going to uh, create a new site, a new campus within the United States that is different in a different location than our two current huge campuses in California and Texas. Uh, we're going to hire 20,000 people, uh, and, and, so, and we're going to spend uh, $30 billion in CapEx uh, over the next several years. And so, we're, what, number one, we're investing and investing a ton in this country. And then, yes, uh, we're also going to uh, buy some of our stock because we view our stock as a, as a, as a good value. And so from a shareholder point of view, if we can buy uh, stock from people that think that it's worth less than we do, then, then that's good for the company. And it's actually, it's good for the economy as well, because if people sell stock, they pay taxes on their gains. Rubenstein and Cook also discussed Apple's growth since he took over as CEO nearly seven years ago. Take a listen. You've now been the CEO of Apple uh, since about July of 2011. Uh, the earnings are up about 80%. So have you ever thought you can't do better than this and maybe you should just say, well, I've done a great job and now I'm going to do something else with my life? We view the, the stock price and revenues and profits as a result of doing uh, things right on the innovation side, uh, on the creativity side, uh, focusing on the right products. Uh, treating customers like their jewels and, and focusing on the user experience. I, I didn't even know the numbers that you just quoted. I mean, this is not something that I, that's not even in my orbit, to be honest with you. Well, so when you uh, announce your quarterly earnings, uh, analysts always say, well, they didn't sell as much, much of this product as that we thought they would, and so does that bother you? Uh, it, it did at one time, uh, it doesn't anymore. Uh, the, the, we run Apple for the long term, and, and so it's always struck me as bizarre that there's a fixation on how many units are sold in a 90-day period, because we're making decisions that are multi-year kind of, kind of decisions, and so we try to be very clear that we do not run the company for people that want to make a quick buck. We, we run the company for the long term.
Well, one of the shareholders who recently surfaced as having bought 75 million additional shares is Warren Buffett. Yeah. Um, are you pleased to have him as your shareholder? Uh, uh, I'm uh, overjoyed. I'm thrilled. <laughs> uh, because uh, Warren is focused on the long term. And, and so there is, we're, we're in sync. It's the way we run the company. It's the way he invests. And uh, so, yeah, so I could not be happier. Well, have you thought about this? Warren still uses an old flip phone. <laughs> I and know. He has no smartphone. Have you thought how much more your stock could go up if he actually used the product? I'm, I'm, I am working on him. Okay. And I told him that I'll personally come out to Omaha to do tech support for him. <laughs> CEO Tim Cook there. You can watch the full interview in the new season of the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg Television. All right, coming up, the big bucks and even bigger audience for competitive video games. Can esports take over traditional sports? We're going to take a look next. And later, Twitter stock has skyrocketed over the last year thanks to the company's turned around efforts. Now the company is making more changes to lure users to the platform. This is Bloomberg. Playing video games is big business, and the numbers of people watching gamers compete in titles like League of Legends is skyrocketing, along with the prize money. Just look at how many people watch the League of Legends World Championship. 60 million. That's more than watch Game 7 of the World Series. One company poised to be at the forefront of this explosion, Esports Arena, a dedicated host and provider of esports facilities and events across North America. And here at E3, gamers can play in its drive stage, which is basically a giant truck with multiple gaming stations. Joining me now, Esports Arena CEO Tyler Endress. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so put, put your business into context for us based on the trends that you're seeing. Tell us how fast things are growing and how you're making money. Uh, I mean Things are, things are growing incredibly fast. I mean, I wake up every morning with something new that's happening within esports and video gaming, and uh, that's always exciting. I said the, probably the same thing about three years ago, too, when we were starting this company. Um, but the, the, the context around it, and it kind of goes back to how we started the company and why we started the company, which was we just wanted to play video games with each other. Um, you know, our college, me and a bunch of college buddies, we had a, uh, our apartment, and we basically built it out to be a land center. And so that we could all play with each other. Land meaning local area network where we all play in the same area. Mm -hmm. um, so that I could watch his screen and my buddy's screen next to me so that I can see the whole map and have a whole competitive viewpoint of what's going on. And now you're making a lot of money doing this. Well, how how, how much goal, money? Yeah. <laughs> how much money? No, and it's, how? It's, it's, so what we do is basically it's, it's, we run it, we started it by doing a membership program where people pay a monthly fee to come in and play video games for us or with us. And so we take that and then we also run our own leagues as well to where you could come out on a Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Monday night, Friday night, Thursday night, any night of the week and you could pay to be a part of the tournament, pay to compete. Uh, and then we host our own events on uh, on weekends as well. It's where we get sponsors that come in, pay a good chunk of change to have them uh, have us do a full on esports event for them from tournament to production. So the Olympic Council of Asia recently accepted six video games as official exhibition sports. Yep. How excited are you about this as a step towards this maybe becoming a medal sport? It's incredible. I mean, what what? What that does, it just justifies the it justifies the viewership for once, and it justifies the fact that being an esports competitor is very similar to being an athlete. Now, I'm not going to say like myself. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not going out running the decathlon by any means. But there's certain things that you know. There's mental preparedness that you have to do. There's practicing that you have to do. There's training you have to do, uh, and there's strategies. And you know, whether it's a team sport to where you have to strategize based on what move you're going to do against your partner, um, you have to do the same thing in esports. And so that's 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 where the highly competitive nature comes in. And where I think the athletes have just this second edge that we don't have um, that creates an eSport athlete versus a normal athlete. Epic Games is providing $100 million in prize money for people to play. Insane. Fortnite. <laughs> um, you know, how, how do you adapt to a, a hit like this? Oh, I love adapting to something like it, that. I, it, it, well, a hit, I don't necessarily think that's a hit. That's a benefit. Mm. Because Fortnite, you know, unless they're going to do a $50 million tournament, that's a, it's going to be hard to go through $100 million in, what, the next 12 months or something? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... it's 
to, to me, they're going to be us, utilizing tournament organizers throughout the world to be running events for them. And we hope to, just like we did with our successful Ninja event in Las Vegas, we hope to be one of those uh, esports tournament organizers with Epic to where they can supply the prize pool we run the tournament for. So talk to us about how big viewership is now and how big you think it can be. Viewership is, uh, the, the thing with viewership is that it's so big, but it's for the individual streamers, right? Mm -hmm. So the individual streamers, guys like Ninja, Shroud, Dr. Disrespect, these guys are incredibly, they're incredibly talented, but they're also super fun to watch. You don't know who they are? Aren't they getting, no, uh, <laughs> see, as Ninja is I mean, getting, oh, are they know, getting Ninja, like yeah. 600,000 viewers? Yeah, that's insane. I know it is. Yeah, he, that's what he did, 600,000 over there. So the viewership for that is growing. Now, the best part about it is that he will average about 150,000 viewers on his own in his own bedroom. But then when he competed and came on our stage in Las Vegas in, he, in an eSports format event, he got 600,000 viewers. So the viewership is growing when there's something on the line and there's a competition at stake. So how do you elevate your status to compete with traditional sports? And do you think that eSports could surpass traditional sports viewing? I, it's, it's just dependent on the video game industry itself. League of Legends has pioneered the industry when it came to watching video games you know, on television, essentially, but mostly watching it through our computers. You know, the, the viewer, that eSport viewer is someone who's not sitting on a couch and watching TV. He's someone who's sitting at a computer and watching TV on his computer because he could also play video games uh, at the same time, or he's watching it on his phone. So that viewership model has totally changed from a, from a traditional viewership model, which is sitting on a couch and turning on your TV and flipping through channels. So I think the accessibility of viewership will make it that, so that it surpasses traditional sports. What are the challenges that lie ahead for you in terms of what could prevent esports from becoming the next big thing? Um, the, the, the foundation. I mean, you know, we at Esports Arena, we're looking to build that foundation, build the regionality. We've got three arenas already, plus our mobile esports drive. And what we're planning on doing with that is creating the regionality between Oakland, Orange County and Las Vegas and anywhere else we decide to go next and that's going to build the foundation from amateur little league type players. Baseball successful is because they have a farm system, they have a college system, they have a high school system, they have a little league system. That's why baseball is always going to be successful because you always have a way to build it up. If esports can have that method of building it up instead of just grabbing from the top down, then I think it'll be incredibly successful. And that's that's what esports arena is here to do. That's what I would love to do is build the amateur competitive base, build the regionality to it, and uh, see how that foundation can grow the future of esports. Okay, esports arena CEO Tyler Andres, thanks so much. We'll be watching. All right, thank you. All right, coming up, Twitter is rolling out new features to better predict what events you want to know about. Could the move bring more users to the platform? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. it will personalize news for users and send them notifications about events, trying to attract a bigger, broader audience with one of its biggest product updates in years. For more, I want to get to Bloomberg Tech, Selena Wang in San Francisco, who covers Twitter for us. Of course, Selena, the story of Twitter has been trying to personalize it better and better for users to attract more users. What's going to make this time any different? Emily, this is actually one of the most comprehensive overhauls they've had in years. You're right, Jack Dorsey's been talking about personalization, orienting the brand around topics and trends rather than forcing people to have to figure out how to curate their own timelines. You're a power user of Twitter yourself. You know that it takes a lot of time and effort to be able to create the perfect news feed. So they want to shift that burden to Twitter to use their algorithms to figure out what people want to know when they want to know it. So for instance, the volcanic eruption in Hawaii happens. Instead of having to follow the Hawaiian government officials, the official earthquake account, uh, commentators about it, etc., they'll actually send you a ping and it'll take you to this events page that will show you a live feed of what's happening and a summary at the top that will alert you to what's the latest. So how are they doing this? Is it better AI? Is it actual humans working behind the scenes to say, hey, this volcano in Hawaii, this is a huge story. I think people need to know. 
So this has been in the works for several months. It's obviously a big process to be able to organize information in live time, which is really what this is all about, is really organizing the content that's already coming through the platform. I spoke to their director of curation yesterday and really wanted to understand how exactly are they choosing the top news stories that someone should be looking at, the trending stories that are personalized for a person. And now it's all about a blend of algorithms and humans. So in terms of picking the top tweets that should be in a particular feed, that's going to be done by algorithms. Right. In terms of the organization of where the story should appear, in terms of actually pushing the button to place that content on the website, I believe that would be done by human. But it's a very integrated blend between humans and machines. All right, Kim Kardashian West tweeted, I had a very good conversation with Jack this weekend, Jack Dorsey at Kanye's birthday, and I think he really heard me out on the edit button. Like, what? Could this happen? Will we be able to edit our tweets? I think as much as power users would like Twitter to be able to implement that feature, from my conversations with sources, it seems highly unlikely. Twitter at its core is supposed to be a filter, a platform for live and real-time information, and they don't want to give people the ability to willy-nilly be able to edit their tweets. I spoke to someone just yesterday who brought up a great point that being able to edit tweets could bring in a lot of uh, harassment and abuse problems. For instance, someone could edit a tweet that they've already posted a few days ago and introduce some potentially abusive information. And then Twitter's algorithms would have to be able to go back and be able to catch that change. Interesting. This, of course, as they are battling, you know, bigger harassment problems across the platform. Okay, Selena Wang, the biggest product update in years at Twitter. We'll see if it works. We should note Bloomberg LP operates a global breaking news network on Twitter called TikTok. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology from Los Angeles and the E3 conference. We'll be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.